Good morning. I'm Sulika Tripathi, Program Officer at Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai. Welcome to the Lens has witnessed photojournalism in the times of COVID-19. Our speakers for today are Professor Nina Berman, who is the documentary photographer and professor of journalism at Columbia University. Mr. Danish Siddiqui, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist and head of the Reuters Pictures team in India. And our moderator for today is Dr. Ravina Agarwal, Director of Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai. Welcome everybody to our webinar, The Lens as Witness, organized by the Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai. The center is one of nine global centers of Columbia University that promotes knowledge exchange, public awareness and dialogue, as well as innovative ways of addressing the most pressing global challenges facing us today. Over the last few months, as many were confined indoors around the world, images became a way to remember our former lives and act as a bridge to understand the new realities developing around us. In this session, our panelists will draw from their work and experiences to reflect on the role, scope, and challenges of photojournalism in bearing witness and recording history during the current pandemic. Our speakers include Nina Berman, who is a documentary photographer, filmmaker, author, and professor of journalism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, where she directs the photography program. Professor Berman's wide-ranging works look at American politics, militarism, environmental contamination, and post-violence trauma, and her photographs and videos have been exhibited at more than 100 venues, from the security walls of Syrian refugee camps to the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. She has many publications, fellowships, and awards to her credit. Professor Berman is also a member of the photography and film collective Noor Images, which comprises a network of global multilingual journalists, authors, photographers, artists, and filmmakers documenting, investigating, and witnessing our world. Our next speaker will be Danish Siddiqui, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist. He heads the international news, news agency Reuters Pictures, the team in India. As a photojournalist, Mr. Siddiqui has covered several important stories in Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Before making his foray into photojournalism, he was also a television correspondent at a leading network. His work has been widely published in various leading papers, international magazines, newspapers, and galleries, including the National Geographic magazine, the New York Times, the Guardian, the Washington Post, and various other wonderful publications. He's received accolades and awards from many international sources. So when the lockdown began around March um, and or April around the world, and many of us were confined indoors, images and the news became a primary window into the outside world and our new and strange realities. There were many viral photos of deserted cities and nature reclaiming its place, while there were also heartbreaking pictures of migrants and medical and emergency workers. So our panelists' presentations that we will now be sharing with you will cover their experience in covering COVID-19, where the nature of crisis is so different from anything we have encountered in recent times. The panelists and the presentations will bring to you aspects and perspectives of the pandemic that they chose to cover and discuss why they chose to cover these. After that, I'll have a few questions which I will moderate uh, in a conversation and then I'll turn it over to audience questions as well. So um, over to you, Professor Berman. Thank you to the Global Center in Mumbai for inviting me and for arranging this um, conversation. I'm, um, so I'm here in New York City. I was born in New York City. And so when the pandemic inched towards New York, um, there was a sense of a, a kind of collective anxiety. So um, my presentation is a kind of a personal one. It's not re really uh, news pictures in a sense. It's more me trying as a photographer, as a resident of New York, as a mother, daughter, teacher, to try and figure out how my world was changing around me and what pieces of it I could hold on to. And so the experience, and I think many people felt this around the world, was strangely dreamlike. And so I'm just going to, these are a mix of uh, small kind of statements, ob observations mixed in with pictures, beginning kind of first, second week in March, 
New York, as many of people know, is a city of 8 million. We live kind of stacked up on each other. We are currently not just in a health crisis, but in a crisis around truth and information. And so it was very uncertain what was coming our way, uh, how to protect ourselves, and what the consequences would be. So um, I'll just start reading and then going through my pictures. A rat's corpse lies perfectly centered on an open sidewalk, reminding me that Albert Camus' 1947 novel, The Plague, has become popular after decades of obscurity. As I walk through my neighborhood, I'm attuned to everyday things which take on new meaning, the virus never far from my thoughts. And so this was a couple days before the lockdown. Uh, you can see rats on the streets in New York. Sometimes they're sort of in, um, smushed into the pavement by cars. It's rare to see one so perfect on the sidewalk like this. And so it felt to me like a strange harbinger of some violent pest. I see boys playing soccer and wonder, will the field stay open tomorrow? It was shut two days later. And so I think in my pictures, um, the feeling I'm trying to communicate was a sense of fragility. You know, as a photographer, part of the reason you take a picture is to preserve it in time. And sometimes you think that maybe that this picture that you took today will be there tomorrow in some form. But in this particular early days of the pandemic, there was a sense that, that life as I knew it would never be the same. And so the things that I was seeing that I would maybe normally never photograph because they were just so normal and every day, I felt a compulsion to photograph. So at Columbia University, where I teach, thousands of students who would have graduated were sent home packing, their fates uncertain. Some of them who had already been given their caps and gowns for commencement, assembled for pictures. So these students were actually performing their graduation. They had not graduated. They had received their caps and gowns early, and they were doing their best to create in the moment a future that they knew was no longer possible. New York City, maybe unlike other major sort of European capitals, for instance, has an enormous unsheltered population. It is one of the most glaring aspects of the class inequity that you see across America, but particularly in New York City, because the wealth is so enormous. And so the poverty is also so enormous. And before the pandemic, on so-called good days, you may have 60,000 people unsheltered in New York City, which is a extraordinary number of people. Usually homeless people are not talked about, thought about, cared about. It's just kind of an ongoing crisis that city officials just kind of throw their hands up and don't do anything. But now all of a sudden these people became potential transmitters of infections to the middle class and the wealthy. And so what was going to happen to them became a public concern, not so much for their own well-being, but whether they were going to infect wealthier, sheltered New Yorkers. And so um, I went down to Wall Street. This is the where the stock exchange is. Uh, saw this man wrapped in kind of a white sheet. All of these thoughts are in my head kind of occurring to me. Where will he go? What will he do? Will I be able to talk to a person like this in the future? Because I, I do talk to homeless people. <laughs> and um, I actually have my students do that. And... Um, you know, what will be my distance? What, you know, will I no longer feel safe talking to someone who's uns unsheltered? So I venture downtown at night to the financial district. It's silent and ghostly, a homeless man wrapped in a white sheet, a lone jogger. Many of the wealthy have fled, choosing to ride out the pandemic elsewhere. The emptiness feels like the weeks after September 11th, but instead of ash in the air, I smell Purell on my hands. There was a lot of flashback deja vu feelings as the virus kind of crept into the city, the sense of loneliness, of ghostliness, of business shutdown, especially in lower Manhattan, felt very, very much like the days after the September 11, 2001 attacks. And this made people feel, um, yeah, well, it brought back, I think, a lot of pain. I took this from my apartment. Um, I was watching television with my partner and our daughter. I was imagining having to stay at home and watch TV all the time, something I actually don't like doing. And so it occurred to me that all over the city, there was, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people stuck at home, just watching TV. New Yorkers live on top of each other. In Manhattan, we're stacked 72,000 people per square mile. We like it that way. Social distancing is for the suburbs. But the virus has put us all in our little cages, alienated, anxious, our eyes stuck in our TVs and screens. This is just a kind of random office worker behind a desk 
with a mask in Midtown Manhattan. Houses of worship closed, which for people all over the world was a kind of insult upon injury. How, how do you grieve your, your dead? How do you find comfort with your community when people you know are sick and dying? I mean, by the time I took this picture, there was already hundreds of people dying a day in New York City. And the main sound that you heard was sirens. Um, so the way churches indicated that they were not open for people was to have this blue tape. And so this is a church in the town with blue tape signaling that entry was not possible. Churches and all houses of worship were closed, leaving those to pray and mourn in isolation. So before the pandemic hit, I was following a lot of activist groups who were aggressively trying to stop abusive and extremely violent practices of the Trump administration around refugees, immigrants. In the news were stories of separation of families between mothers and children. There were thousands of children still, and there are now, um, imprisoned mm -hmm. in cages, separated from mothers and fathers whose only crime was to be fleeing violence from their home countries. And th this was a kind of a, a billboard that was secured to the wall of a church near where I live to talk about that, about family reunification. But during the COVID crisis, when I walked by this, I thought, oh, so here we all now are in social isolation. And we're just experiencing a little, little, tiny little sliver, a little almost privileged sliver of what people who are imprisoned and isolated from families feel all the time. Along with September 11th, another kind of crisis that the coronavirus triggered among longtime New Yorkers, and I am a longtime New Yorker, was the AIDS crisis of the 1980s. Thousands of people died in New York. Entire neighborhoods were wiped out. Some of the most creative artistic stars in our culture got sick and died. And this is a statue made by Keith Haring, who is a famous graffiti artist. Uh, it appears in front of an office building in Lower Manhattan. And for a lot of doctors, who started their practice during the AIDS crisis and were now in hospitals dealing with the COVID crisis. This felt you know, different, but also very similar in the fact that there was nothing they could do to help their patients. And so I think if you talk to doc doctors and nurses now, one of the things that was so traumatizing is they could not save people. They did not know really how to save people. Driving through the streets of Lower Manhattan, I'm overcome with emotion upon seeing a Keith Haring sculpture who died of AIDS. And the feelings I have remind me of those dark days in the 1980s when the AIDS crisis ripped the heart out of New York's creative community. A few weeks into this pandemic, I know two sick people and two dead people. Uh, yesterday, the paramedics arrived in my building and took an old woman from the 12th floor to the hospital. Rumors and whispers was the COVID. How could it not be? What elevator was she taken down in? Was it disinfected? Where is her family? Is she intubated? There is a tremendous sense of um, paranoia or, or justified concern. It's un unclear what. At the time, you didn't know what you could touch, what you could not touch. So everything was, cons was thought of as being potentially infectious. You know, I was going outside every day. And so it created a sense of um, real terror and a kind of like a mind twist. You know, what games do you play with your mind to convince yourself that you're fine, right? And so, um, which were games, and I'm sure um, Danish has the same, you know, um, had the same experience that you want to go out there and, but like, where is the virus? Is it everywhere? Is it in the air? Is it uh, literally floating down on the ground as you're walking? And so um, it created a kind of, you know, often kind of parallel experience where you're trying to go about your daily life and not get too hooked in to the fact that, yeah, that for me, the potential of leaving, of course, my daughter without a mother. Um, so I found it strangely um, exhilarating almost and uplifting when I'd go on a street and I'd find someone who had created, you know, I mean, this man was wearing a World War I mask. Is that going to help him? I don't know. But there was something kind of creative and artistic about it that I really appreciated. I ran into a young man outfit in a World War I mask. He was strolling up Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan, and so this was all perfectly normal. I wondered if I needed a mask like that. The coverage of the pandemic went in kind of different visual spurts, you know, um, um, empty streets, overcome healthcare workers, funeral parlors, 
but the second the second aspect of the pandemic was the economic destruction and and tragedy and Fifth Avenue, which is, you know, a kind of showcase for the biggest international brands in the world and, you know, where the wealthy can go in and, you know, drop $100,000 on a little shopping thing is, you know, is not uncommon, became completely empty, deflated. So all of this um, wealth and luxury and kind of primping to be seen on the street was completely gone. And in its place, you know, in this particular picture was a young woman, 38-year-old woman, who was trying to get money to get a room for the night because she was homeless, but there was no people on the street, so she had no one really to ask for money. Fifth Avenue went home to some of the highest retail rents in the world is empty. The luxury brands have lost their appeal. Amy, a homeless woman, was trying to hustle $20 to get a room for the night, but no one was on the streets to offer her a helping hand. Yet one of the things that I think energized people all over the world was this incredible ritual, you know, um, that would happen at 7 p.m. I don't know if this was true in... India, but in all across the United States at 7 p.m., there was this clap for healthcare workers. It was the kind of the one bright spot of the day. And um, there was something quite theatrical about it. It was almost like not just three cheers for us, but it was the moment where people came outside and actually did something together. And so, uh, yeah, this is a woman in front of NYU Hospital. This is up the street from where I live. Uh, firefighters would drive their fire trucks to the hospitals and create a kind of sound for the uh, healthcare workers. At 5 p.m. each day, the New York City Department of Health releases the numbers as of April 7th, 3,544 confirmed dead from COVID, but that doesn't include the approximately 200 people dying at home each day who never got tested. The body count is staggering for a city of 8 million people. Meanwhile, nurses and doctors don't have the equipment they need. The front line is collapsing, laying bare decades of profiteering, corruption, and negligence. So I started to get interested in these labor actions that were being held by mainly nurses, some doctors, but mainly nurses who would stand in front of hospitals at great risk, really, for their own job and call out uh, the practices of hospitals and the fact that there was not enough PPE and that they themselves were being treated poorly. And I found these nurses incredibly moving characters. These were refrigerated morgue trucks, which you could find all around the city. In Central Park, dozens of white medical tents house the patient overflow from nearby Mount Sinai Hospital. Refrigerated whisper trucks or mobile morgues are parked outside of every hospital. Where to put all the bodies is becoming a logistical problem. This morning, the governor announced grimly that there may be no other choice but to turn the city parks into temporary graveyards. This is a hospital, a makeshift hospital set up in Central Park. Of course, um, my work in this time, you know, is um, more than this, but I thought that this would give you a good sense of kind of my thinking, the way I approached it uh, from a, both a, a personal and journalistic standpoint, and also a mix of text and pictures. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nina. And uh, that was very, very poignant, you know, uh, your own journey and in that time period, but also tying into the broader histories, the continuities of alienation and trauma of the city and of the people who live in it, and yet looking at it as the disruption and the continuity. So I thought that was very, very poignant. Let's, um, let's hear from Danish and see some of his visuals. And I encourage or those of you in the audience, you can keep sending in questions that we will take later or, or your thoughts or reflections. They're most welcome. Good evening from Delhi, India. Thank you for Columbia Global Centers to invite me for this discussion on pandemic and photojournalism. I'm a chief photographer for Reuters, as Ms. Ravina told you before. And uh, I had a team of very talented photographers who are covering this pandemic in this country of 1.3 billion people, which is almost every day we, the cases are rising. And we are number two right now, and unfortunately, we'll take over the U.S. in a few weeks to become the number one uh, country, a very unfortunate position, though. Uh, this has been a really, really year where a lot of things have been happening in India, and the year started with the protests which were happening over the country against the citizenship of law. And the pandemic came in between in March when the protests were actually at the peak, there were riots where few people lost their lives. And then the pandemic hit the country. And of course, the protest had to be dissolved because of the pandemic. In the last week of March, uh, the Prime Minister Modi uh, 
Prime of India, Mr. Modi, announced this unprecedented lockdown. And it was called it unprecedented because it was locked down for 1.3 billion people, um, which was uh, unimaginable. And people got like almost like four to five hours to get into their homes or to go to the places where they could go. This is not India, basically. Indian streets are known to be full of people, full of traffic, full of life. But this is the, the first picture is the first morning after the lockdown. And you could see like, um, it's, it's a kind of urban slum on the left and there is a highway, uh, the road, uh, arterial road going from, the, from Delhi and it's totally empty. Or you can see on the right side of the highway. Down is the heart of Delhi. It's actually the world city of Delhi, part of that, the tourist center. And it's almost empty. And this, is un this was unprecedented. Uh, this was a tough call which was taken so that the virus can be contained. We were still, we had still had very few cases, but according to the government, the cases would have risen at an exponential rate if this lockdown would have not happened. Of course, people saw what how this lockdown was implemented. It can be debated how harsh it was. So this is like, uh, I think, the third or the fourth day of lockdown when people actually started queuing up for food. A lot of people who were queuing for food were not coming from any, were not like uh, India is infamous about, especially the cities about like people begging on the street. These are workers. These are daily wage workers who used to earn and use a part of their earning to buy food. And they, there was no work, nothing, so everybody had to come for food. And it was the charitable organizations and the commons then later pitched in to provide food for these workers, these homeless people. Of course, nobody knew this pandemic would hit us. But of course, there was no planning. There was no blueprint that if something like that happened, what will happen to these millions of daily wage workers or homeless people on the streets of Delhi and other metropolises. India's cities, especially metropolises, are full of migrant workers. They build the cities, they build the infrastructure, they all come from far-flung villages or uh, what do you call it, or the small, really small districts where there are not enough industries and they migrate. Sometimes they are farmers also. A lot of times actually that they can't farm or they, the produce is not so much that they can survive. So they come and work as laborers in the cities and then they go back once the season uh, once the, the season of farming, they will go back. We knew that there are migrants in the city, but nobody knew that, like, how many migrants are there in the city. I'm sure a lot of people must have seen this first picture of this migrant worker carrying his son on the shoulder. It was a very common sight. But this picture was taken just after two or three days of the lockdown. I was driving down one of the main arterial roads in Delhi and was totally, totally empty. And it was, like, almost evening. And uh, I knew because it was track, it was getting hot, so most of the migrants used to start walking in the late afternoon so that they can walk through the whole night. This young man, his name is Dayaram. He's of course a migrant labor, also owns a little bit of land in the village, but that uh, the family can't survive. He, along with his other extended family members, were like around on the right side, you can see around almost 50 people, they started walking and it had been like almost one and a half, two days and I caught them. And then I started following them. But the, the crisis was so huge that I couldn't, I, I couldn't stay with them, even though I wanted to. But you can see people were just walking through the streets. This young group of men took refuge in a refrigerated truck not knowing the consequences what would have happened if if they would have traveled for long they were going around 200 kilometers from from delhi and luckily unluckily the cops saw them or caught their truck and they had to take them off so people were taking all means of just crossing the border uh, to Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the most populous state in india and which also connects bihar where a lot of migrant force comes from Bihar. So the whole point was that to go to Uttar Pradesh and then just, just cross the borders of Delhi because once you cross the borders of Delhi, then you might, there was a good chance that you will be able to go home and people had gone home.
as a, as, a, as a journalist, I had seen a kind of exodus while I was covering Rohingya that was totally different level. But here it was like how people who had come and left their home to get some uh, better life were actually running away from it. And most of them said that they will never come back to the city. The, the kind of pain the city was giving to them, uh, they were being looked upon. Uh, of course, there were a lot of organizations which were trying to help them also in terms of food and water. But uh, but the way these migrant workers were were treated uh, by uh, unfortunately the population or the residents of the city was was sometimes a lot of times I saw it. It was not not a, not a good way to treat some other human being. But these are the same migrants who actually made these flyovers or actually made these roads or made these apartment buildings. Uh, if you can uh, move to the next slide, please. So I want to come back to there. Um, uh, I have been following him for the last uh, almost six, seven months now. And uh, so once there, Ram um, reached his village, that's him carrying his son on the way to the village. It took him uh, three or four days to reach uh, uh, his village in central India and Madhya Pradesh. And of course, he would, was able to hitch a ride because a cop on one of the orders allowed him to get a ride on a truck. Of course, people charged money, but whatever they had, they gave away. And that's Dayaram's family uh, in their village. So when Dayaram reached, there was harvesting season uh, in April and he had some work. His farm is like really tiny, but to earn some money, he worked as a laborer on other people's farms, both him and his wife. And uh, uh, these are two, his two sons. And they, because they can't survive in a city like Delhi, and he can't take care of two kids, so he has to always leave one of his kids, and there are always emotional scenes uh, whenever they have to leave the sun. So as you can see, like, uh, these are some recent pictures which I took of him while he was in his village, and they were preparing to leave, come back to the city. They don't want to come back to the city but they have to because they just don't have money. Everything has run out. The food has run out, the money, the money has run out, and they are already in debt. They have already took loans from a lot of people like private money lenders with exorbitant uh, interest rates. So they don't have any option. They have to come back to the city knowing that similar thing can happen again. That's his wife uh, and they actually, they were trying to build their own wall because uh, uh, their wall collapsed during during the rains, heavy rains, and they didn't have enough money. So they borrowed some money at like a really high interest rate from a local money lender. And uh, even to come back, they had to sell some stuff from their house and again take loan from the money lender. So these loans are just piling up and to pay this loan, they have to come to, come to a city like Delhi, which is the closest biggest city where they can get work. So right now he's in Delhi, he's, he's got some work. Of course, he's not working at such a high wage because there's a lot of supply of labor in Delhi right now because of the economic factor, the real, most the real estate and the infrastructure construction has really gone down. Uh, so there's a lot of supply and the demand is really less. So he's almost working on like 40% less rate both him and his wife, and even his father and mother. They also work at the construction sites. Um, the younger kid, he just hangs around with a smartphone. That's the only way he can you know, entertain himself. So of course there's no education and uh, nothing is just like living from day to day. So yeah, it's like he's in city and uh, he misses his son. There are always emotional scenes in the whole village because almost the whole, the hamlet, which is owned by a particular caste people who go uh, to the to the city, and someone or the other is going to the city, and they're leaving back, usually their kids or old, really old parents. And uh, once when when I was there, it was just like kind of like you know there was crying and wailing happening from every house because somebody was leaving and they didn't know when will they come back. And as you can see, in the truck. There are these relatives and neighbors who all came back, who all walked from Delhi, and now unfortunately they have to go back and take the same route. But this time they had to pay, uh, of course, bribe this truck driver who could 
take them across the border because of the because they don't want to get stuck with the testing and other formalities because if they get stuck there then they have to go into isolation centers or and then they will lose uh, that day's wage so yeah they all drove all the night and then they crossed the borders and finally they could bypass the health workers and reach the city i want to touch on the rural health care which is one of the most one of the very important topics in in, in india especially where uh, the budget the overall budget for the healthcare is really really small and a lot of it gets un- is not even spent and especially that part uh, there is not much actually which goes to the rural health care also so while while everybody was uh, concentrating on the deaths in the metropolis like delhi bangalore mumbai or calcutta i wanted to see like what what's happening in the hinterland they always happening in the countryside so it was a challenge because nobody had because i was sitting in delhi the flights had started uh, domestic flights had started but i didn't want to take any risk so i took a, a journey to the eastern part of india a state called bihar which has the worst uh, doctor to patient ratio i think in the world is like one doctor for almost 26000 people i wanted to see like what what's happening uh, uh, in states like these uh, where a lot of migrants have come there is nothing no rules are being followed and the cases are not rising so much as we expected but what's happening we were only getting the coronavirus pandemic pictures from metropolises and i think it was very important to to showcase what's happening in rural so i went to a place called bhagalpur and um, try to do photograph covid-19 hospital so this covid-19 hospital is one of the, well, was one of the six hospitals actually and uh, the population of bihar is human this is huge it's more than a lot of countries in the world if if bihar was a country in itself it would have been 13th or 14th most populous country in the world uh, so this is a place called bhagalpur uh, so this is uh, a medical college in uh, in bhagalpur which was also a covid-19 hospital and um, uh, as you can see everybody is potentially covid positive the hospital was uh, basically a medical college and was uh, the, the staff of the medical college the professors and senior doctors used to contribute in the hospital the bhagalpur district was really struck by this pandemic and the top administrative government of india represented the top administrator for the law and order the top administrator for the police the top administrator for the medicine everybody felt sick and were covid 19 positive including the superintendent of this hospital who felt sick there was nobody to take care of what is going on in the district and this district was catering to around 6 7 districts so it was a huge population and also the floods had hit uh, uh, this part of bihar so there were floods and there was pandemic so for example this hospital uh, the superintendent of this hospital there was a uh, it was a psychiatrist basically a sick professor who raised his hand and said i will you know lead the fight against corona virus what i wanted to show the picture it was like the glossy icus of delhi and mumbai were like totally in different world as compared to rural healthcare in india where you can see there's no check you don't i mean like the beds are overflowing with patients you don't know which is covid positive which is covid negative because there are no tests which are done so at that time there were no swift tests which were being done icu wards the patient on ventilator was lying on the bed and the relative was lying on the floor so it's like and the same relative used to go then to the market do grocery shopping and go home so so technically everybody in that city was kind of a super spreader the streets were chock a block with traffic and uh, there was just no 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 system because the guys were just too overwhelmed and uh, but luckily there were not many deaths which were happening and i just wanted to show you the how how the beds were overwhelmed here uh, this is on the left side uh, the first picture is actually of a patient who is covid positive who came in the hospital with a certificate that i am covid positive please get me to a separate place the hospital authority says sorry we don't have beds you just have to lie with non covid guys and this guy was there for the for the next one one and a half days until they found a bed for him in the covid ward 
And as soon as they found the bed, they said, okay, let's let's get the guy out of here. They called a couple of uh, warden, uh, ward boys, and of course they didn't have enough PPEs. So they had what, just one layer of PPE, one layer of gloves, and they didn't have any protection glasses. So they said, okay, what should we do? So they said, okay, let's, let's wear our sunglasses. Maybe they will protect us. So it's kind of like uh, at that time, there were not enough protection equipment also. As you can see in the second picture, the guy is being, same guy is being carried and uh, the oxygen cylinder is being carried by another, another ward boy who was getting, who was then shifting them in the, in the ICU. Luckily, luckily the guy survived. And, but after one week of taking this picture, uh, the son who is pushing the stretcher, he got COVID positive and he, he became really, he became seriously ill. And uh, in the last picture, you can see that an um, ambulance is being sanitized, kind of sanitized, in the Great River Ganges, which was just behind the hospital. Because these are the private ambulances, and at that time, there were no service uh, centers for ambulances which were open. And of course, they wanted to save the cost. These ambulance drivers they used to carry the patients and drive them 100 meters behind the hospital. This is just behind the hospital and just wash the ambulance and kind of sanitize it. I said like, okay, this is like a two-tier city. Let's see what is happening in the first line of defense between the rural population and the medical uh, and, the, and the healthcare system in this country. So that is called the primary health center, which is like, which has six doctors, few nurses, few testing centers. So I wanted to see like, what will happen in the village if this is happening like this? So I went to a village which was not very far from this district center, which was like 20, 30 kilometers. And, and this was a coked ward. I was shocked. Like, you know, it was like, the f this is a COVID ward. It's an isolation ward where actually if somebody, people are tested, if somebody is positive, he has to be kept there until uh, an ambulance arrives to take him to the district or he has to stay there for a day or whatever. So this is officially a COVID isolation ward. The flood water is just there, almost on the door. The COVID ward hasn't been cleaned for the last three days. I had to tell the superintendent of this, or the medical officer of the, this primary health center that when was the last time it was cleaned, he said, oh, the guy refused to come because he got scared that he might get COVID. So they are just testing and leaving the stuff there. And of course you can see the state of PPEs in, in the in the COVID isolation ward. This is what was happening to the rural healthcare system uh, in the country, which we actually don't get to see, and it can't be undone uh, in weeks or year. It has it has to be done over a period of time. It should have been done long, long time back. Actually, pandemic has been a kind of blessing if people want to see it. Like it has exposed the vulnerability of Indian healthcare system. We are still rising, the cases are still rising. The virus has reached at the hinterland and that is much more dangerous because in cities you can get some kind of health support, but in these villages, it is next to impossible to get such kind of healthcare system if there's an emergency. So the other thing was like, of course, as we Selena told about like, very important part about this pandemic, uh, unfortunate part is that like it is taking away people. But the most unfortunate is like I have covered wars and all, but like uh, there is no dignity in death in wars. Uh, but here there was no dignity in death in in your own city, in your own country, which was not actually at war, but it was at war. Uh, when the cases started, in, in, in uh, especially in Delhi, uh, it was like we, we were not sure like whether we should cover it, how we should cover it. Of course, there was a protocol, the security protocol, which were taken up with our security guys. Actually, I was shocked whenever I was going to these graveyards or crematoriums. I had never seen things like that. I never imagined I would see it. Uh, in my own city. These are some of the pictures uh, which you can see from the crematoriums and the graveyards and how there was actually no, I would say, no dignity. I mean, it's like I saw where the, the dead body used to come and nobody from the family was there. 
and it was uh, very sometimes very heartbreaking that not even the family member could see you for the one last time uh, because maybe they are also positive or maybe they are they have been told not to step out of the house because they are in quarantine bodies sometimes like for example the ambulances sometimes were carrying like almost half a dozen bodies back together uh, sometimes the excavating machines were being used to push the bodies in the in the graves so it, it you know this is like a very sacred thing in, in any way that like once you are dead this has to be some dignity but i think coronavirus took away the dignity also in terms of that people the thing is that slowly and slowly uh, these dead people are just becoming numbers it is becoming part of data and uh, uh, i thought about it a lot and like i wanted to give uh, in a way like some faces to the numbers and we just did this project and we just did a project on india is about to hit 100000 case uh, 100000 cases death cases in a couple of days and we are releasing this set of pictures which includes people who have died and the phones are being held by their immediate family members it includes young people old people people from all religion people from all caste professionals like doctors architects police you know so we wanted to show that we wanted to actually give back some dignity i, I personally wanted because of after covering so many funerals and and so many uh, <clears throat> ceremonies at the graveyards i for me i of course never saw the face of the victim but for i just wanted to give it a kind of little dignity back to them and i wanted to show that these were the real people who were behind the numbers and this is a project which uh, we will Uh, release tomorrow and it it includes people from north of india from kashmir to south in kerala so that's it from my side thank you very much danish um, and that was really uh, very moving both the presentations were you know uh, extremely moving because one of the things i was thinking about while you were presenting is that you you talked about the word exposure and i was thinking of the interplay between what is invisible and visible you know in some ways you have the the infrastructure of the city that we see every day that suddenly now kind of transformed by your images and by the realities that are going around into something that we forces us to see what we don't see as a result of that engaging with that everyday infrastructure whether in nina's case it is you know the the contrast of the financial district and the shopping district against the homeless person you know or the refugees just the movements that have been stalled so what you don't see it suddenly makes it very visible and gives it exposure as you pointed out or the entire rural pipeline that keeps our cities going in your case danish so as consumers of this uh, of these images and being part of a pandemic they are no longer distance it's not like some bhagalpur blindings that were happening you know it's a city where we had uh, horrific incidents happen in 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 uh, 1979 80 it's not a distant thing that happened somewhere it implicates all of us as viewers because we are collectively part of a pandemic and we collectively have to reflect on what it means to be a citizen of a city you know what it means to be that citizen and what we have in making invisible so um i'm i'm very emotional about your presentations i think they are you know uh, very very uh, necessary and uh, they are they are great reminders of uh, what we need to be thinking about what visibility we need every day and that the pandemic the invisible enemy in that sense we we had to use that phrase when we did a program on film is is an opportunity to continue to use invisibility to oppress others and place or it's an opportunity to reflect to make visible the inequalities that we live with and perhaps chart a way of coming back to a new reality that is more inclusive so i i'm going to not get into a lot of my own questions because in the interest of time because we have lots of questions that are really wonderful from the audiences so i'm going to start off um and they're not so different from mine so i'm going to start off with some of them um 
Harman Khurana asks, how important is the aesthetic appeal of a photograph for a photojournalist? Uh, so just, you know, in terms of the presentation, how, how did you make these choices about aesthetic appeal? Do you, were you thinking of a standard to meet or were, in your, or were you thinking of, a, was something coming to you in this time of social distancing as an aesthetic that was emerging from your work? Well, for me, aesthetics are really important to my work. Um, I think more than if I was um, a hard news or a press photographer, because I'm I'm looking for pictures that speak to the moment, but also maybe speak to something beyond the moment, something maybe more interpretive. And so for me, it it's important, but it's not something that I that I necessarily understand I'm doing beforehand, right? I mean, especially this kind of work because I'm I'm being reactive and responding. It's not that it's as investigative as some other projects I'm doing. Um, but there has to be a there there, right? There has to be something <clears throat> something there as well in photojournalism. There has to be a reason you're taking that picture. And um, I think the presentation I showed kind of floats between, you know, a couple of different types of photographic practice. Um, uh, same thing for you, Danish. Did you find a certain kind of aesthetics? I mean, Nina, you said that you didn't always consciously think about it, but did you find um, an, an aesthetic emerging when you look back at your at your repertoire or your archive? You know, of the pictures that you took because of social distancing, you you your your aesthetic changed in any kind of way. Um, I'll I'll start with you, Danish, on that. I I think it changes a bit, uh, of course. Uh, you are not so close to people, first of all, okay? Uh, and uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, but uh, you have to, as you said, because of social distancing and other rules, you have to, you have to take, you have to keep those things in mind. With me, I think it was, uh, it, it, it didn't come like automatically. I think it just meant into me. Like, I was not worried about it so much that uh, at the end of the day, you just have to tell the story. And aesthetics, another thing, a secondary thing, the message should go out. I think that is more and more important. Uh, so yeah, that that is that that was the only thing which was on my mind that the message should go out. How did you, Danish, make people feel comfortable around the camera? This is Alisha Thakur asking this question. So it depends, like what you are doing, and uh, I, of course, if it's breaking news, and I know I can't have conversations with people. I will just do my job, just take pictures. Uh, of course, keeping in mind the privacy and the other uh, ethics of journalism. But uh, usually, uh, for example, with this migrant who I've been following for more than six months now, it's, it's a kind of bond which happens over uh, uh, talks, a lot of talks, a lot of, lot of tea cups of tea, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's kind of relationship which builds over. This is more of a documentary photojournalism, which I, which really, uh, uh, which I love. But for me, the bread and butter right now, or for any wire, because my wife photographer, it's the spot news. But this is the kind of stuff which we also do in Reuters, like the long format photojournalism. Uh, to make people comfortable, you just talk to them. And uh, you, you, you will see, like, once people treat you as just another person, the, the, the way the pictures are taken, the output is totally different. That is the more real stuff which comes out. Uh, because if we just take pictures, uh, people might not feel comfortable. They might not, you know, whatever, ask you. They might not be just what they are. But uh, I have done projects in the past of, for example, following child brides for five years, six years. So it was kind of a relationship which builds over uh, over a period of time. But conversation is very important. Of course, uh, you can't have a cup of tea all the time in these times. If people don't want to come, want them to come in their house or, you know, interact with you. But again, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of challenge, but you over, the, over a period of time, uh, you learn how to make conversations. That is more, I think, one of the most important things if you're doing a long format for the journalism. And, and Nina, you also talked about a history in some ways of interacting and, and having conversations both as a, 
um, you know, fellow New Yorker, but also as a teacher, encouraging your students to to talk to in in, in an everyday context. So, um, hopefully, those uh, practices were also helpful when you were um, you know trying to capture images in this time. I want to ask you um, a question that Devyansh Gupta has put forward. Since you didn't have a particularly a press uh, you know card, I assume, uh, how did you get permission to shoot? Was this uh, allowed? Were you were you being allowed? to go on the streets and do this? New Yorkers were never told they must stay inside. They were advised to stay inside. And so, um, but you could walk out on the street and you could go to the store and you could go on the subway if you wanted. So yeah, you were, you were free to move. Did you wear any, you know, were there any safety protocols that you were taking? Did you wear any gear or, you know, while shooting? Yeah, Did you I, I wore a mask. Um, I was not uh, going inside of hospitals. Um, and there became a lot of pictures inside of hospitals in New York, which was extraordinary because normally these institutions are closed to photojournalists. So um, this was indicative of the hospital's desperation to get the story out. Um, but even in these nurse protests, it, it was a little bit frightening in a peculiar way because you're outside, but people were still crushed together. It was very difficult uh, for photojournalists to maintain social distance. It just goes against everything that we've learned. It's, it's, it's like so counterintuitive. And, um, and occasionally I'd see a, a photographer back with a long lens and and you know, I dart in and then and leave, and you kind of figure that all the nurses there were probably COVID positive. So I, I wore a mask. I I was wearing gloves, and I didn't really see any reason to wear gloves. I was washing my hands constantly. Yeah, and as all of us were, you know, super hypersensitive to any small little sniffle or cough, which became almost impossible to handle, you know, mentally. Um, yeah, but but colleagues of mine who were covering COVID wars and ICU units and um, friends of mine who are doctors and physical therapists were, of course, all, you know, uh, masked up and um, protective eye gear and coverings and would, you know, get out of their clothes uh, as soon as they walked in the door and things like that. Danish, similarly for you, were you, um, you know, were there any challenges to your mobility when you were covering things and, uh, you know, what kind of uh, protections were you taking? I was very, very lucky that just before, like six or seven months before, before pandemic in India, I'm actually I'm the only journalist in India, probably the only journalist in India who is trained in infectious disease coverage training, which is given by professional doctors. So I just had that training. Um, like I would say six months before the pandemic. And of course, we didn't know what would happen in the next six months. It was more for my planning to go to Africa for Ebola, which was much more deadlier, I believe, in terms of death rate. So, of course, I was uh, somewhere outside the country while I was having training and was being trained by the doctors. And the training also taught me how to protect myself, but it also put a sense of fear in a way, which is, was good, because I think uh, it's always good to have a sense of fear when we are covering these kind of conflict, I would say, uh, or these kind of, uh, because it, it makes you think that you're also vulnerable. So I knew, like, what is the boundary which I should not cross? And of course, uh, if whenever I was going to red zones or like ICUs or high risk areas, which we call, I was always... Uh, uh, having conversation with my security folks, uh, which included, of course, medical professionals. Uh, Safety-wise was fine because sometimes I used to see people dressed up in PPEs in the street and taking pictures, which is of no use. It was like, you don't have to wear a PPE in the street and take a picture. The thing was like people didn't, most of the journalists actually didn't know what kind of mask to wear what to wear, when to wear a headgear, when to wear the glasses. So I think it was really lack of training. Uh, but luckily for our writers, guys and folks, uh, we had a crash course and uh, all the journalists who are in India from Reuters are, can actually go and shoot in high risk zones because we have trained them over a period of time. We make our own stuff, how to like, they can contaminate and things like that. So yeah, it was it was challenging in the in in in, in the beginning, but like yeah, we, we took yeah. that. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, 
there are several questions about this issue of you know the difference when you're when you're taking pictures of very vulnerable people you know how do you um, not be a voyeur and or how can you leverage this kind of unique and poignant storytelling to encourage collaborative action for supporting communities and these are questions asked by priyanka bhosle and yash manglik so i'll start with you nina you know how did you do you think that your images and your archiving uh, these moments um how do, do you consciously connect with um with um activist groups or with uh, you know groups that are supporting communities do you get approached by them for using your images how how do you plan to leverage this um yeah in this particular set of pictures the only thing that would that's relevant to this question is the pictures of the nurses um this was actually an internal struggle within the union the nursing union about the leadership also of the union and um so for journalists just to show up because these these were some of these were sanctioned by the union these protests some of them were not for journalists just to just show up to acknowledge that these stories are are real nurses were holding like impromptu memorial services in front of hospitals for their coworkers and so my role in that moment is to to document to tell that story to kick it out on social media so they their their message can be amplified beyond that i'm not working with nursing communities although i know columbia is doing it's a bigger question about whether journalism and you know the connection between journalism and activism and different people have different thoughts about that um but for me that was not my role in telling the story um i'm not really photographing the pandemic now for me it was like a kind of two months of when new york changed forever and what really will this change end up and i think that's the bigger question right is um who gets to own the future after this moment and is it going to be the forces of inequality is that what we're going to see increase or are we going to see a kind of reckoning and a refashioning and um i'm not sure yet i think that you know both just just in the action just in the act of recording and you pointed out that people weren't going in they weren't telling the story of some very real crises that healthcare workers were facing so in in recording and getting it out there um is that is a form of action in in that in that manner and um danish you talked about dignity you know of recognition again of um not making this invisible or, or all the kind of the stigma associated with dying from covid but but recognizing it in a meaningful manner uh, so photojournalism in that sense offers that um opportunity to record and in recording you know rescue those who are neglected or stigmatized in some ways from uh, from the annals of uh, forgetfulness and 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 bring them to a very to 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 the public side so i think um that was very moving and I, and i think that's right i mean we can go on about you know the there are very nice questions about anita patel deshmukh is also asked about the power dynamics between the photographer and those being photographed um and i think i agree with you nina that's a broader question for journalism in in you know as a whole um i want to move on to the role of media uh, social media did you use you know social media of course uh, you know has its own limitations and you know with sensationalizing certain you know aspects of the of the pandemic and there were quite a few restrictions on social media at least in india and what you could and couldn't pass on as information um and there was constant fear that it would somehow distort what was actual true factual information by official sources how does social media um offer you an opportunity you know to tell your to to bring this work out into a broader public and or does it like you know or is it just um once again you know um fighting amongst a uh, fighting to be heard in in a cacophony of voices how did you feel social media media contributed to your work well i immediately started posting on social media you know i'm not sure what the situation is in india but here there's still a debate whether the pandemic is even real so which is astonishing as up to 800 people were dying a day in new york city and so it is extremely important for people with authoritative voices 
who command positions of respect in their industry to put things out on a regular basis because you're competing with a massive disinformation infrastructure. And so um, that was very important. It was also the way people knew if you were okay, actually, like if you were alive, right? If you like how you were doing within your neighbors, just on a personal basis. And um and I think the the publications, I mean, there there was a period of time, I would say a month, six weeks, maybe eight weeks, where photojournalism was just like at its most vibrant I had seen in the United States in a long time. That publications invested a tremendous amount of resources and realized that even if we're all going under or going broke or whatever is going to happen in six months, that this was an extremely important moment. And so that was quite encouraging. So not only am I putting my own work out there, but I am, you know, routinely amplifying the work of my colleagues, which I think is um, sometimes something not readily discussed when we think about social media. It's not just, oh, I want to post my pictures because I <laughs> like them or feel like they're important, but I am constantly promoting work that I value, that I see is essential for other people to look at and comment and understand that this virus is real, that there are things we need to know about it, that there's, you know, um, some things are working, some things are not working. And, you know, kind of keep your eye on the ball instead of, you know, uh, being distracted by the, the political manipulations of our various leaders. Yeah. Um, same question for you, Danish. The thing is, it's like, uh, I, because I work for Reuters, I get a pretty big platform that my pictures are distributed all over the world, like to various kind of clients. And even when I write text, it gets, so it's, I don't need a platform, platform so for, but yes, I use social media because I think it, I take it down more seriously since last one, one and a half years now, that I think it plays a really important role. And I think a lot of my, a lot of people who follow sometimes my work, they are not, they don't have access to writers, pictures or whatever. Uh, uh, so, and I, Lot, get a lot of times approached by people who have been constantly following my work that if you they have any information they want to share with me which I can wet later and see so I get a lot of tips and leads uh, from from uh, people following my work and uh, I think uh, of course uh, there, there are uh, restrictions about how you want to use social media but I think it plays a really really important role especially for a journalist in terms of distributing information and taking information. I think, especially Twitter, I don't take the other so social media platforms more seriously for information. I think Twitter is, is quite, quite important these days. Okay, um, there are lots of questions coming in, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask a final one to both of you. There are lots of questions about the profession of photojournalism from various people. Um, and of course, it's a very sharp, tool for visual storytelling, recording history, and forwarding investigation and information. And, um, you know, raising awareness, arousing sympathy. So what message do you have for students based on your experience as, you know, a photojournalist, and particularly in this time of, um, you know, a world pandemic? So what message do you have for students who are aspiring to become future photojournalists and documentary, documentary photographers, uh, Danish? And then I will ask this for Nina as well. I think the, right now, uh, that in the coming time, there would be a need for more photojournalists or visual historians, as I call them. And I can assure you that the job will be much, much more difficult in the times to come. But uh, especially it will be difficult for the photographers or the journalists or the news photographers or for a journalist who would be on the front lines, whether it's COVID, where you are exposed every day to the unknown enemy or to whatever protests which are happening or how the things are changing in this world. And also the biggest challenge is like people are getting flooded every single day with avalanche of pictures on social media and whatever things they consume, you know, there's just pictures, pictures, pictures coming in. So it will, it, it, it's a big challenge for people who would be entering this field and how to make their work stand out. I think it will require new ideas. 
not the cliche ideas won't work anymore. And of course, the new execution, execution styles, I would say, to catch the attention of the consumers. And of course, without compromising at all with the ethics of journalism. So that is very important. Uh, so, but I can assure the students who want to take up this profession that at least in my experience is one of the best professions. It's, uh, I would not say that for other, for me, it's monetarily okay, but not always monetarily uh, such a uh, <laughs> great profession. But the most important thing is to tell other people's story. It is an honor, uh, which very few people get in this in this world, and it also comes with a lot of responsibilities. And I can assure you, if we if we all uh, the, these coming these students who take up this position, if they perform their duties well uh, with keeping all the ethics and journalism, they can have always have a good night's sleep. Thank you, Nina. You do this. Uh, you know, uh, you, you're a teach, you're a professor, and you have a lot of students that you mentor and and teach. How? What? What message do you have for our students who don't always have the privilege of being in your classes? So, what could you say about photojournalism? Well, I think it's a profession for people who um, definitely want to live in a social context. People who want to analyze, experience, be compassionate. Um, be engaged in the world around them. And so that, I think, is the, the most important part. You have to be willing to open yourself up and to also be a good listener and to know why it is that you want to be there. It's not, for a, it's not a casual thing. It's a serious profession. And so you have to be willing to do the work to get the respect and trust of people as Danish said, it's an honor to tell their stories. And so you, um, you have to be seriously, serious minded. And it's, it's not, um, although it occasionally may seem like it's somehow weirdly glamorous, it is not a glamorous profession. It is very much a serious, hardworking, physical, phys like uh, um, challenging physical profession. But one that um, has been very meaningful um, meaningful to the people that, that are in the pictures you make, meaningful in terms of the colleagues and the support in the community. And also, you, I think everyone I know who goes into this profession wants in some ways to see a better world. And I think that's actually very important. Uh, thank you, Nina and Danish, for the, you know, the beauty in the visuals you shared, the information and the learning that we derived from them, and for the deep humanism in the messages you imparted. Um, thank you so much for participating in this, and uh, thank you to a great audience um, who's been very interactive. We look forward to seeing you at other events of the Columbia Global Centers, Mumbai. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.